I'm Carrie Corgan, and this is The Opus, an exploration of legendary records and their ongoing legacy. In our latest season, I'm joined by Lizzie Hale, Warren Zanes, Daphne A. Brooks, and many more to revisit Jeff Buckley's Grace. We discuss Buckley's femininity in an era of hypermasculine alt rock, how the record's mythology was shaped by his tragic death, and the delicate work of keeping his legacy alive. Find us at Consequence of Sound or wherever you listen to podcasts. Consequence Podcast Network. Welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with it's an interview series presented by WFPK Independent Louisville at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. If you're a if you're already a subscriber, thanks so much uh, for tuning in multiple times every single week for these interviews. If you're not, now's your chance to hit that subscribe button at anywhere you get your favorite podcast from, like uh, like iTunes and Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can follow along there, and you can subscribe on YouTube as well. We do put out these interviews, as I mentioned, multiple times every single week, so it's a good way to stay up to date, especially if you are a music geek who likes hearing about the process. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today, my guest is Ben Folds, and it is a music geek dream all about the process. You see, Ben just released his autobiography. It's called A Dream About Lightning Bugs, and it is a thrill ride of an autobiography. It's an amazing story, and especially if you're a fan. And while he leaves few stones unturned, I will be asking him about some of the questions I gleamed from that book, like being a piano band in the post-grunge era, mining the small moments of his, uh, of his childhood and young adult life for these very big opuses that he would go on to create. We'll talk about Brick, of course, as one of those specific moments, but we'll also talk about the way music imprints on a memory and the importance of music therapy in his life at this point and the importance of albums in his life, where he sees that. He's been crowdsourcing online from some of his fans for, uh, for lyrics, which could lead to an interesting concept album. And speaking of concept albums, I'm going to ask about a weird little record that came out in 1998 called Fear of Pop which technically was his first solo album. It was called Volume 1. Will there be a follow-up volume? Listen in. It's Kyle Meredith with Ben Folds. Hey, man. The congratulations first, A Dream About Lightning Bugs. You've got a bestseller on your hands. Right off the bat, you are a best-selling author. That's not a bad uh, way to start this uh, period of your life, I guess. Congratulations. Thank you. No, no, it is it's very nice. I think I mentioned this to you, you know, when we were talking up in New York, but uh, I wanted to say it again. I've never read about the moment of takeoff for any band and, and felt it so frightening to me as a reader and exhilarating before. There were so hmm. many points at, 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 as I was reading this where I had to set down the book and walk away to, like, calm down. <laughs> I, it's written like that oh, so well. Did you ever have that feeling, you know, having to go back and, and search through those memories again? Well, I felt it at the time. I think it's like anything you do for the first time. You know, it's scary. Like, there's, you know, first time you, first day at school, first day you bully pushes you, first break up with a girlfriend. I, I, I think that, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of training for just kind of entering the rock business. So I've got that chapter called Welcome to the Goddamn Music Business, and I kind of tried to show how my life actually was measurably different and what I didn't know to expect. And without it being, I think possibly by simply being not dramatic in its presentation, it's possible that it feels more real. I just told it like I like I felt it with the hope that it would be something that, you know, would inform, let's say, kids coming along that might want to, quote, make it in the music business. Or the other side of the coin was I thought about amateurs who were grown up, who, meaning amateurs, because they chose another field. They chose, instead of to, to chase music, they decided to, you know, maybe they're an accountant or an architect or something like that. And I, I kind of thought maybe it's a good thing to see that sliding door a little bit so that you can realize you made a choice because it is a choice. And a lot of times we look at it as everyone is somehow in the uh, in, in the running for the Music Olympics and only some of us make it. It's like, no, no, not, not many people choose to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in the people who have done it and completely walk away. Those are the ones I get really interested. Like, how'd you do that? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, like like Cat Stevens or something. Right, like how'd you do that? Yeah. 
So once it's in there, yeah. Reading you talking about the music business, I had sort of forgotten how interesting it was that you know here's a piano band. I I feel like I remember in the time reading you calling it wuss rock back in the nineties. Yeah, you know you'd you'd had grunge and and you talk about how actually a band like Nirvana helped out Ben Folds Five coming up. But once it starts happening, like there's a period of of where pop rock gets a, a moment in the middle there. But really, you start coming up when the active rock thing boils in, you know, and 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 the heavier yeah. side of things. It's incredible that you were able to kind of break through it all, given mm. the state of the industry. Yeah, I mean, I think our way in was my general instincts that if you find a place on the highway that doesn't have you know a lane that that everyone's not in and the reason that they're not in it is because it's either something that no one thinks is possible or it's too much work you know like people are going like i don't want that lane like that's because there are a lot of things throwing you out of that lane for instance like you know when we started as a a piano rock band we're trying to get booked into clubs and uh they're like yeah we'll we'll put you on folk night or jazz night no 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 we want to play on a real night you know you couldn't get booked to right there you know the message might have been that's not a lane you can, that doesn't exist but as soon as we started doing it and we're stubborn enough to do it then it's kind of like well now we have to move our own piano on the stage that certainly would put a lot of people out of that lane so there, there's a lane that you can only be in if you're willing to do all that work and you know i think once that's been done then the next thing was like okay well we're playing punk rock clubs heavy grunge clubs they, they all stink everyone's got got you know nose rings and tattoos and mosh pits and stuff and we were in there with a real baby grand piano on stage suddenly the fact that we're kind of not welcome is as punk rock as you can get so it all you know it's i don't know it all it, it all kind of works out for the the instinct of just going going to the the the, the, the path less traveled you know or yeah. less traveled yeah that's um i can remember being inspired by your bands especially as you were coming up and as i look back on it now i think one of the things i did take from that as as the one saying goes work smarter not harder i took that other route of work harder not smarter and that's the one that paid off for me too and i i think i have you all to think a version for that Oh, that's really, yeah, that's a cool way to think of it. I mean, it, 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 it is like that. It is kind of like I'm willing to get on the treadmill and run twice as fast. If, if it's like, are you serious? That's not the way people are doing it. I mean, that's the way we were doing with the, the book sales. I mean, I'm on tour, so I'm doing double duty. I'm doing the, the book and the rock thing. Not many people would do both of those at the same time. And before shows, I'm speaking to large groups of people, shaking every single hand and signing four to 700 books. That wouldn't be something most people would want to take on. And my feelings like, you know what? If we got to do this one at a time, yeah, that's my way of thinking about it. You know, work, work harder, not smarter. <laughs> uh, as a fan, of course, one of the, the the many great parts in the book is when you sneak in what one of the songs was about. And, and, and I noticed you didn't set it up like, so I wrote this song and this is what it's about. You're already in the middle of a life story and suddenly as the reader you realize, hey, wait a second. I know which song we're talking about. And I start Mm. to realize how great of a lyricist you are at taking what seems maybe like a very small moment in your life and creating, you know, these mini epics out of. You know, whether it's mm. you sitting on a suitcase. And, and I know that right. would go on to become a life-changing moment in its own way, but, but there's just a moment of you sitting on a suitcase, and suddenly it becomes this, this, this whole big thing. I always want to make the best songs, and if what I've got to work with is that, then it's what I'll use. It's like Randy Newman saying he, he'd run over his grandmother for a story. <laughs> So for a song, and 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 um, I've always said I would run over Grant, uh, Randy Newman's grandmother for a song as well, <laughs> but I, I I think that you you know if I think I can make the best song out of complete fiction, I will be there. Do it. If I think that what I need is the emotional torque that exists behind a real story and the feeling of that story rather than the story is always important because and you don't do that by telling people what the feeling is. You don't lead the witness with a minor chord and say, and this was so sad. <laughs> It makes any sense to me. It doesn't work. I don't believe you when you do that. But if you can tell it's big to the guy telling the story, even if it's big and he's trying to avoid telling you what it is. I mean, if someone tells you something horrible had happened, you know, ask a, a veteran their war stories. You don't go right into them. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's something to think about is how open are people and how waiting being closed, how that adds to how real it is. And the more real it is, the bigger it is. 
you might feel like it's a big, you know, David and Goliath moment, but you got to get someone there, you know. And um, I don't know, it is, it's a lot of work. And, and, and every time I've ever set off into a song or the book to try to achieve that, you know, I'm just moving a lot of parts around. And what happened? How did it feel? What happened? How did it feel? What didn't happen? Can I make that up? How did it feel? Sometimes it's like, you know, someone will say that, that was forever. It took forever. Well, it didn't take forever. It, that took hours. It took 10 minutes. You have to make sure that you convey that somehow because that's what it felt like. If you just tell a story and say it took 10 minutes, like, like we were in an earthquake in Hiroshima on the 40th floor of a hotel. And I was interested in hearing how long people thought it took. So the next morning, we're all trading stories about whether we were in bed or going to brush our teeth and how we held on to the furniture while we were getting tossed around. And, you know, one guy says, God, you know, I think that must have lasted for about three minutes. Well, no, it was eight seconds. Of course, when you write these, we want to know what they're about. And it's one thing if it's a song like Stephen's Last Night in Town. It seemed like it was a very different thing when it's about Brick, you know, a song like Brick. When did, you know, for a long time you were reluctant, and you talk about that in the book, you were reluctant to talk about it. When did you finally make peace with that where you were able to talk about it and end up on a, you know, a television show where you're playing a parody of yourself in a drunken state like Give me a drink and I'll tell you the song. <laughs> well, I think everything blows over. It's like the comedians are with their too soon stuff, you know. It does blow over. And uh, right, right when, right when um, Brick was out, you know, I had all kinds of mixed feelings about. I remember the, you know, the the sentiment that the uh, parents of my girlfriend had put out there, which wasn't wrong exactly. You know, I was getting ready to profit from a thing that happened to their daughter. So I, I tried to make it so the promotion of the song wasn't about it, and that the song was about the feeling of what had happened. And for me to color it at that time would have felt kind of wrong, and there was great risk politically. You know, I mean, it's bad enough to write a song about a teenage abortion from your own point of view. Uh, it's worse. In a way, it's worse, or it's more dangerous to speak up as a, as a, as a male. I mean, most of the time, you know, most of the time, the, the, the real landmines are, are, are laid for 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 women, you know, like, as, as I, I don't the, the incredible privilege of being uh, <laughs> a man historically in our society. But but when it comes to stuff like that, you know, that's that's touchy because for me to say here's how it felt this abortion thing. So you know, people could very easily say, okay, so your girlfriend went through all of this, and you're sitting there talking about your feelings. So it's a it's a tightrope to walk socially and politically. People go crazy about that, you know. And and um, so I, I wanted to stay out of the fray. And I wanted to leave it to be about the feeling. Uh, oddly, I would find maybe five, six years later that there were two major sort of lists for some reason. Everyone's got a list for something. Two publications, and one of them a conservative publication, which said that Brick was one of the maybe uh, top five or top one. I don't know what it was. Pro-life songs. And then the other side claimed it to be top pro-choice song. I got on both lists. That's probably the moment where, and this was pretty close to each other, and it kept the irony of it kept popping up all over the internet. So I kind of took that as relief. It's like, okay, I'm through that. It has an ending that could flip either way. I noticed that then. I noticed that now. It's still a, a song that I can put on that I've never tired of. Luckily, separated from any personal story to it, I can just take it as a really mm. great little song that puts me in a in a place in the world you know and it's mm. i for a so i'm not the songwriter of this and and when i think about that it's like what a weird little relationship you know we have with with songs from the person who yeah, wrote them in the moment sure. they were and and who we are listening to them it's <laughs> no it's it's i mean but it goes back to music is communication and um it becomes a backdrop you know, your your music is out there enough it becomes the soundtrack whether they like it or not to people's lives I, mean, I remember this song that probably defines my 11th grade or 12th grade at school, Alan Parsons' project was everywhere. I am the I am the sky. <laughs> Look at you. Like I, that's that's I didn't really even like that song, but this is it's the it's the soundtrack to my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I do like that song. I unfortunately came of age in that moment we were talking about earlier, whereas you were coming up, but also so was Limp Biscuit and. Uh, as much as I don't yeah. like that band, I know that song. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I mean, and, and on the, the Alan Parsons thing, I actually I did dislike it. It just, it, I'm just saying that because it was there uh-huh. is why it became, I mean, I thought it was fine. I didn't go, oh, I don't want to hear the song. I don't have an association with it, positive or negative. It just reminds me of that time so much. And that's, it's sort of where the book starts, the way music imprints a memory. And, and tying yes. that, to, you know, to more present day work, 
you've been a big advocate of of music therapy and its importance. Do, do the two mm-hmm. kind of find each other in that? Well, all the roads start leading to certain things. You're interested in stuff, and I was interested in um, acapella music because acapella groups were singing my my songs, you know. And so my, those were my people. I always wanted to be covered as a as a songwriter. And suddenly, all these all these acapella groups are doing wonderful versions of my stuff. So, I mean, narcissistically, I'm interested. I want to hear what they're doing. I, I don't know a lot of the versions of what they do were better than what I had done. So I was really interested now. Also, it showed, oh, that this is the this is the soundtrack to their college years. Is the, all of them singing together, like in their formative years, they're singing my music. How amazing! What an honor that is. And I meet some of the kids, and they're all into music therapy. They're like it's kind of the most peaceful people you'll ever meet. And you know, from there, it's like okay, I start advocating for them a little bit, and I find myself then on certain boards and panels, and pretty soon I'm meeting people as music, uh, you know, therapists, neurologists, and meeting uh, uh, a lot of teachers, educators, orchestras, and so it all just sort of, you know, they all had one thing in common, which was, wow, they really need some cheerleaders. Like, I should step up and learn a little bit. I went to some music therapy, you know, kind of courses. So I don't know it, but I mean, it's, you know, it, uh, I'm, I'm interested enough in it to, to get out there and cheerlead for teachers, cheerlead for um, music therapists and music, uh, uh, you know, funding of arts funding for Americans for the Arts. And it all kind of leads from one thing to the other. And if it doesn't, it doesn't take so much of my time that I can't make a living, then I'm fine. And we just kind of draw the line right there at the point that, that we can't do anymore. <laughs> I have to stop, you know, which we've had a couple of those moments. It's been like, you know what? We can't say yes anymore. So we actually have to go to work now. <laughs> and you have said yes to some interesting things. I find, you know, for any artist who's been around for a long time, as a fan, it's always seemed like albums become a little bit less important as you, as you go on, and maybe it's just the cycle and and everything. But you know, yeah. and as I look, you know, so there, you know, that's that's four years in the rearview now. Do you find that's the same for you? Does does the idea of oh, I need to make a new album, does that become a little bit less important? Yeah, but it's hard to say. I think every era since in the short lifespan so far of rock and roll music and music is you know we don't, we don't know enough about it yet. I think. Uh, what the real trajectories are, but it seems for my career, and, and, and I, I think maybe it's probably true of the industry. I, I don't know how how you know the album has been less and less important as an industry. The idea is that you know the artist can pay for it and do it in their bedroom, and if that sinks and swims, or whatever, take it away. We'll find out and spend money later. I came up in an era where someone had to take a risk in order to make the album, and it was a financial risk, and that changes the landscape quite a bit. So now when someone says, "Yeah, you should make an album," I'm like, "Yeah, great. Let's. Well, I could you." Use a about two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar budget. Let's do this. Oh, well, well, that's not what we do anymore. So we'll have some fucking respect. If I'm going to make a record, I'm going to make it right. It's like you would build a house. You have to build a house. It costs money to build the house. You can go call in all your favors and do these things, but it's like I find the incentive less and less because I have to call in favors from friends. I have to do things on time that I would get paid doing other things. And then once it gets out there, there's not the same, you know, there's not the same uh, sort of distribution and uh, the whole system has changed. So I can't, I don't know if that speaks of just a regular trajectory that has been true for artists or if that's mine specifically in this particular time. You know, I will make another album because I have to make albums. But like, you know, William Shatner wanted to make a Christmas album and he's been wanting to do that for years. He just can't wait to make a Christmas album. So he calls me up every once in a while and says, make a Christmas album. And it's the same thing happens every time, which is I call a few labels and I say, Bill wants to make a Christmas album. I go, fuck it, hey, Shatner's going to make a Christmas. It's going to be awesome. I'm like, okay, and we can have all these great stars sit in. They're like, yeah, great stars. And then I'm like, and it's going to cost you $250,000. That's what it's going to cost. Like, oh, pff, oh you know, I don't think we can do that. I, don't, you know, I can't do that. So I understand that's their business. The bottom line doesn't allow for it anymore. And I think that that is a big deal because the, the, the way that you can capture music and have it be at all live and capture the sound of the instruments and kind of do it, quote, correctly, that's expensive. Always has been. The, the, the room is expensive. The equipment is expensive. It's just expensive. Mm-hmm. It's like making a TV show or a movie or something like that. It's not bad, but to say it costs that money. If you if you decide to make a cheap album on Pro Tools, fix all your shit in your bedroom, add reverb spaces that don't exist, have to 164 tracks of stuff there at your fingertips in, the, in your bedroom, you can make something that sounds like an album for very, very cheap. But the difference is, is that it, it won't have, it has to be an album that's going to be good without having 
humanity all over it. And that's why when you listen to hits now or you listen to the newest thing, as good as that stuff is, and I think that this, I don't think it's any worse or better. I think it's just people are artistic and they make good stuff. But I think what it doesn't have is an identifiable sound to the soup behind the singer, mm-hmm. you know, the, the band behind the singer. Like I used to be able to go, I buy a record by Squeeze in the 80s. Well, I can fucking tell who that band was. It was the moment that the drummer counted off and started playing. The band had a chemistry. But can you say what the chemistry of Bruno Mars is? I mean, his voice is fucking amazing, but you can't say what is behind him. It's, it has any consistency. Nor nor did the killers, you know, like like that sounds computerized to me or it sounds computer controlled or some informed or edited. Doesn't I don't go, wow, that's definitely that band based on the rhythm section. I, don't, I, don't, I went off on a tangent, but that, that's the thing about making records these days. is It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different game. I feel like someone who, he, who, who comes from the era of having made silent movies, now they're making talkies. Like, I, I don't even know what it means. It, it looks like uh, also when you do want to make a record, you seek ideas you know, to, to get it going. Am I reading right? Um, I don't know if I'm saying this right. Patreon, Patreon. Uh, asking, Patreon. yeah, asking uh, some of your fans even to write lyrics, and and then you would put music to them. I mean, that offers yeah. a concept that's different. Yeah, and whether or not that ever ends up being an actual album is another thing. But I want to. You know, this is a matter of kind of pulling back the curtain. The Patreon is an interesting concept because it's it, it's it's for it's a crowdfunding platform mostly, but we've sort of hijacked it to be a broadcasting and connecting platform. So we're not really using it the way that you normally use it. It's something that I discussed at length with Jack Conte, who runs the thing and is an old friend of mine. And, um, you know, it suits our purpose really well. It means that people can can kind of have a little subscription, and we don't push it too hard. We don't advertise it too much out there. There's a few, you know, there's 500 of us, and they sign on as I, um, you know, play records for them, or they can send their lyrics, and I'll say, well, here's what I would do with these lyrics. And I, I write a song to it, and we talk about it, and, and uh, you know, it has a little educating thing, as little bit of a keeping in touch with my fans kind of thing and it's just you know, in, in a funny kind of way for someone who works all the time it's come a little bit of a social life because i you know break basically bring them into my office and turn the record player on we drink scotch and listen to records and talk about production <laughs> i love the scotch part of it uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with a, a very selfish question here i'm a fan of a little weird record named fear of pop uh it was called yeah. volume one i've always expected and hoped that there would be a volume two do you think that's in the cards at this point, I'm going to go straight to Volume Three if I do it, because that's just the, that's in the spirit of the project. Mm-hmm. I did um, I did a thing for a, a, a Jeff Garland movie on Netflix called Handsome, and um, I kind of played it crazy instrumental music for him based on concepts he asked me to write without watching the movie. So he's like work, play, theme, and um, another one was um, uh, love and evil stripper. <laughs> so <laughs> those those are Jeff's prompts. So I made music to it real quick. He came by, listened to us. He goes, dude, that sounds like it's in the movie. That's amazing. This works really great. We, 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 we can get the cues up and just edit. This is awesome. I had fun. felt very fear, fear of pop-like, and it made me think I need to make another one. One of those songs, actually, we just used to put in uh, Joe Scarborough's Moscow Mitch line. I just dropped it into the song, and uh, you know, people like to say it. Uh, I've been a big fan of that. I'm very interested if it ever does happen. Uh, but whatever, I'll be listening regardless because I always do, and I always appreciate everything you do, Ben. Congratulations. Thanks, yeah, congratulations again. A Dream About Lightning Bugs is one of the most fun books I have ever read. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. No problem. It has been a pleasure to talk to you, and, uh, and we'll see you around. All right. Good talk to you. See you out there, man. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Mr. Ben Folds, the autobiography is called A Dream About Lightning Bugs. He'll be on tour this fall. Now let's talk about some bonus Ben Folds interviews. First off, just a couple weeks before we recorded this latest interview that you just heard right here, Ben Folds stopped by 30 Rock, New York City, MSNBC, to sit down on the set of Morning Joe. It just so happened to be my debut as a musical contributor for the Morning Joe crew. I don't have that one on here, but I point out that that one is online now, and you can check that out, and it's sort of a a compliment to this brand new interview as we discussed a a a few more things that were happening in Ben's life uh, with his new biography. And you can find that one online again. Just uh, just search Ben Folds MSNBC Morning Joe. But as far as the next parts of this podcast, uh, I'm going to include three other interviews that I've done with Ben through the years. One of them actually with Ben Folds 5. Let's turn the clocks back just to 2015 right now when Ben had just put out an album called So There. 
It was a collaboration with Y Music, and it's one that uh, Ben and I recorded backstage at Bonnaroo in that 2015 year where we got to discuss playing at the White House, lots of boxing metaphors, comparing prog rock to classical. It's part two of Kyle Meredith with Ben Folds. Mr. Ben Folds. Hey. Benjamin Franklin Folds. How, how close did I get? Pretty close. Is that really close? It's been Benjamin Scott Folds. We were only like... Uh, 17 letters off the alphabet. I was going with the syllables. I, I figured your parents would have went with a, a kind of a syllable thing, you know, like a little Benjamin, Benjamin Scott Franklin Folds. Folds. Yeah. Oh, that's good, too. Yeah. yeah. Benjamin Scott Folds. Benjamin F. Thing Folds. <laughs> <laughs> that was what they called you later in your teen years. Yeah, well, they, they called me Tripod, actually. That oh, was, is that right? Yeah. That's different. That was gym class thing. Yeah. <laughs> that was different. Dude, uh, I'm so excited. I know you got a new record coming out later this yep. year with Y Music. That's correct. And it's called So There. That's correct. So there. You're getting it all right. That's it. I've done a, That's the interview. Yeah. I'm going to answer the questions that's for good. you. You know how you made that album one time? <laughs> it's a, turning into a Chris Farley thing yeah. uh, automatically. Uh, before I get to that, though, uh, you were at the White House recently. Yep. And I guess you played for the First Ladies, right? Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. It, 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 like, that's got to be a little bit more pressure. That's a different kind of audience. It is. I mean, I'm always worried I'm going to say something stupid. You know, uh, that's the big thing is just some sort of... Not so late in Tourette's coming out or something, yeah. but I mean, you're a master of the f bomb. Yeah, like masterful. Masterful, yeah. Yeah, it's, that's it's, how you use it. That's high skill, you know. <laughs> it's a skill that we can all uh, uh, hope to have. Some, you know, I, they were they were great, and and I, I didn't say anything stupid or foul or, yeah. uh, and I, I don't think I messed anything up too badly. And uh, Michelle was. Miss Obama was great. Yeah, she was. Is there she was a really, really interesting person. I really liked her. Is there anything you wanted to get away with at the White House that you, you had to pull yourself back from? Like, I figure there's some hijinks that you just want to try. You know, no, I'm not nearly that naughty in those situations. I'm just thinking, don't mess up, don't mess up. Thinking about, you know, like, uh, what I'm going to play and just little stuff like that. Looking at paintings going, wow, that's a nice painting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this was kind of for uh, for armed forces and, and, and things. Yeah, and it was. Such, it was. Right? It, yeah. yeah, it was for as for wives of, of, mm. of veterans and, and servicemen. You do a lot of charities. I, I tend to well, think like you match up a lot with uh, various cities and stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. You know, you can't do everything. I do the things that present themselves and seem to resonate. You know, and a lot of what I do is uh, music education. Something means a lot to mm. me. I feel like if education is cruising along and and and, and people know history and music and art and philosophy and those things that the world could only be better so that is something I feel strongly about doing you can't feed everyone in the world you can't educate everyone so it's one of those things it's like I, I think the more that I do the more I get asked to do the more I have to turn down right. and now I have a total guilt complex about the 10,000 things I couldn't do last <laughs> week but I do I do what I can to mean something to me I, I've been in the music business long enough now to where I can do what the hell I want yeah. so. but not every artist takes that opportunity to give something back to, to try to change the world try to help the world I, in whatever case not everybody does that yeah I mean I, I, I mean optimistically I almost feel like if someone's been like I've been making records for I realize now 25 years right and 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 I feel like if you've been doing it for that long chances are you're also the kind of person that can multitask do a couple things and wants to give it back I make that assumption you, you know what the headlines are going to be what Ben Folds capable of anything capable you just anything. laid it out there for us just with that right you, there well I set them up and you knock them down <laughs> Really well. We'll take this on the road. Okay. So, yeah. so that means we've moved on to self, uh, self-promotion. We've moved on to self from, Did you like that? We've moved on from, yeah, I do things for other people to buy my an album. Yeah. Um, Which, by the way, the, the album artwork that I saw, it's you in boxing gloves. That's not the well, album art. Well, I'm sorry. Art. It's, it is pr- promotional art. Yeah, yeah. The album art is, uh, is an interesting piece that uh, the flutist on the record painted. Okay. And I'm really fond of it. Um, so what's what's with the gloves? I mean, are, am I looking at a parallel? Are you a little beat up in life, or? Uh? Uh, you know, we just thought it would be uh, that has more to do with the piano concerto. That's where the idea came from. Mm-hmm. So on the new album, there's a concerto for piano and orchestra. The this idea is your, like 21 minute piece or 26 mm-hmm. minute, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and this this um, the the photograph was like photograph of the piano player and the piano having having it out. The piano winning. So I, you know, we're in a boxing ring and the piano wins in this photograph. <laughs> you, you, we talk about it being that long too. Uh, at what point do you try to write a prog album? Because now you know you, you're doing these long mm. pieces, and, and I don't know how thin the line is that you could just kind of just push on I, a little bit over there. You know, I think I've jumped the fence, and I? I mean, I've jumped the shark. <laughs> I jumped something. I mean, there. I mean, it's a, it's a. 
you know, a prog rock album, I guess, is, is you know, takes a lot of inspiration from symphonic work mm-hmm. and, and, and operatic work. And, um, you know, thematically how those things hold together, where rock pieces are, you know, songs are three and a half, four minutes long. A, uh, you know, you know, they're, they're, you know, like a piano concerto is easily at least 20, 25 minutes long and often upwards of an hour. And um, so, yeah, so I think I I just jumped the prog part and went straight to playing with an orchestra. It's kind of funny that you put it that way, and, and I almost feel like we're in such a genreless era right yeah. now, Like it, especially when, you know, you, you, you hear about kids coming up and, and coming into their own you and how they this, perceive yeah. music. Yeah. Like, that's the whole thing. It's like it, it's not so genre-fied as it was for either of us growing up, you know, where it was all in the CD stores, and this is rock, and this is rap, and this is classical. It's funny, we were just talking about how Bonnaroo was ahead of the curve on that realization. Yeah. Because this festival has always been really not that concerned with curating in a real literal sense. Mm-hmm. To go, okay, here's one band, here's another one, they, they're exactly alike. Mm-hmm. It's so, uh, you know, I think they were ahead of that. And that's, you're right, you're right. I mean, th- we're in a generation, or we're in an era now, which is probably... You know, in in, in, uh, in in art history, you'd look at that as a repopularization era. Yeah. Not that nothing new is coming up, but much of what's new that's come up has been like where Lady Gaga started the ball rolling with just almost a collage of repopularization of things and uh, and the context being out of context and what that means. And that's yeah, I understand that. I think that's great. It's a vocabulary. It means something new. The symbols are old. The meaning's new. But that's that that is that's just how we get the new sounds. It's I when all that stuff starts to come together. And yeah, and it always has been. And, and uh, but, but right now, I think, you know, you can really sit in a style and just do it. You know, yeah. like, like I'm, I was, a, you know, I was kind of a, um, an artist that maybe sounded like I was stuck in the 70s when it was the 90s. Right. Now to look back on it, it doesn't sound as much like that as it did, you know. But, but it's always that old saying that I, I've said in these interviews before. That's how you draw Beethoven to the Beatles. It's not so far away. Yeah, like, it's not so far away, and it's one step at a time, you right. know. And that's all coming across in your new record. Well, thank you. I mean, it's uh, the new record is you know it's a it's a classical sextet. There's no electric instrument on this record. There's no uh, bass on this record, right. but it's still rock music. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're we like rock and roll. It's good. I'm the rock musician dressed in classical clothing. They're the classical musicians dressed in rock clothing. Well, I can't wait to hear the rest of the record when it comes out. Ben Folds, thank you so much thank for dropping you. by today. It's oh, been a pleasure to talk me. to you. All right, on. All right. Let's do it in the sun again someday. Ben Folds back uh, 2015, recorded live backstage at Bonnaroo, talking about that uh, record, So There. Now we'll head back just a few years before that, 2012. That's when the reunited Ben Folds 5 put out a record called The Sound of the Life of the Mind. I caught up with them at the uh, DeLuna Festival in Pensacola, Florida, out in the very bright sunshine. And let me say, it was a really big deal for me to be talking to this trio right here, as they've meant so much all throughout my life, but especially in my uh, my formative coming-of-age years in the 90s. So here's part three of Ben Folds with Ben Folds 5. Weekly feed, Kyle, Meredith, I've got Ben Folds 5 back, finally. Welcome. Thanks. Back from the living dead. Good to be here. Yeah, we've all been stored in... Um in road cases in a in an attic somewhere. <laughs> You've aged well. Thank you. Carbonite. Yes. <laughs> ben, Robert, Darren, uh, it is good to have you guys back. Uh, you know, the 13-year absence. Uh, but you, you're back with a new record, uh, and it's fun. I mean, everything that I think the fans have wanted this record to be, uh, it is. Thank you. Um, you know, what, was it always a thing where you knew that you were going to get back together, though? I mean... You know, because it was always uh, the amicable split. I mean, did you know that you, it was, this was going to happen? That it was origi- eventually going to get here? No, I don't think we knew we were going to get back together. Uh, it just sort of felt right. Just, you know, no, re- you don't really know what you're going to be doing in a few years. Right. right. I mean, you, you know what you'd like to be doing, but it wasn't a plan. It, yeah. just, it just felt right. Yeah. Oh. I mean, you know, There's more I never, more. you know, I never didn't want to get back together with right. the band, but I didn't think it was going to happen, and right. then... You know, then it just sort of came about in 2008 when we did a, a MySpace broadcast mm-hmm. and we did our, our third record, uh, uh, Unauthorized Biography of Reinhold Mester, uh, front to back for this MySpace show. And we came together so well and it clicked so well and it was so effortless playing together. I think, you know, the seed just sort of popped into our head like, well, we should do this again. Right. Because it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, I, it does show. Um, one of the things I find interesting about this record, though, and I don't know if it's planned or not, but it starts out with Erase Me, which is kind of like, is it, I mean, is that intentional? Is this a clean slate? Is that how you guys wanted to start? 
Oh, it was intentional to put that song first, but not for that reason, really. I think, I think we uh, we sequenced that first because it seemed to be just enough. There was enough of the trademark in the band in it, and yet it's it's really also uh, a lot different for us. Yeah, it seemed to be a good place to start. Um, and probably the that's, in my opinion, that was that was sort of the the least sort of uh, sensational statement we could make. You know, you don't want to make it. You know, people are gonna put the record on the first thing that they hear in the sequence, and they're gonna go, okay, well, it's this. They're back with ballads, or they're back with up-tempo yeah. songs, and this one seemed to kind of cover them both. So I felt good about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's a song that has growth written all over it. You know, I mean, I think we're able to handle these kind of broader subjects or or more challenging kind of you know musical ideas a little bit more ease. It was good to kind of put our best foot forward. Yeah. You know? Well, who are you guys writing for at this point? I mean, you've got a new generation that seems to find, you know, every time you put out a record, Ben, that continues with your solo career and everything, but, you know, are you writing, it was this record when you're starting it out like that? It's a skank. For the old it's fans? It's skanks. It's just like a dance, <laughs> solid dance jam from start to finish. It's just a, a total, like, yeah. you know, hike them up kind of record. Get going, get yeah. going. I think we write for ourselves, first of all. Mm -hmm. We've always sort of done that. And second, like what Robert said, mm -hmm. hike them up, skanks. Um, <laughs> That's number two, right? right for both. I mean, yeah. And sometimes I, it's one and the same. I mean, that describes yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, so it starts out like that. Oh, I'm sorry. You can. No, it's. <laughs> okay. Please continue. I think. Uh, I, <laughs> um, I think we're just always been a band that's trying to make ourselves happy in the studio first yeah. and foremost and we know if we're getting excited about an idea that hopefully it'll resonate with other people mm -hmm. and like Robert liked to point out especially skanks with high skirts yeah which couldn't be more untrue but I, I think that that There's we're pretty yeah I don't, yeah we're pretty um, <laughs> you know, we're like a self-producing little unit you know I mean sure. it's a bit of a like a jazz band I say that loosely I don't yeah. want to make my jazz brothers upset but I just think that you know it's a, I think it's musical at its core yeah. and, you know I don't think we're trying to impress anybody outside of the, the band or the you know outside of our engineering staff that any musical artist that's successful probably is mainly writing for themselves mm -hmm. skanks skanks skanks. And for the skanks I think it's true I think we're even from from the things on the top ten on on down anything that's successful you're doing it for yourself. There is a turning point on the record, though, and it comes with Sky High. And I feel like that is a turning point. Uh, and, and there goes the next Ben Folds 5, or whatever that was. The way the uh, the piano plays off the bass even remind me, that there's there's some kind of old feel to it. And I, even, I, I don't know if I want to bring up the name, but like Mark Cohn, and there's that uh, style of an early 90s singer-songwriter that it feels like it's a beautiful moment. Uh, I love that. That's been years, right? It is, but what the band does with it is really special, and we've always we've always put a lot of time into our ballads and as well as the rock tunes to try to make an album experience that has it all. I don't, you know, I mean, so I mean, even if you look at our old records, there's plenty of great ballads from Evaporated to Brick to Selfless, you know, yeah. on and on, and um, so a good album experience should have you know a nice flow to it. it I think you know it's it's sort of what we do, and we enjoy all. Of it. All yeah, the aspects yeah. of that. Well, let me tell you, ask something here. Um, is Ben Folds 5, now that you're all back together, really an excuse to go back to a nostalgic version of yourself, to be that Peter Pan? Because you can be no. something else in this band, though. I mean, you've always been able to be something else in this band. I think when bands reunite, there's a lot of speculation on what drives it. And I have to say, this has just been very organic. Uh, we just really, it just felt good to play music together. We realized we had something else to do together, and um, there really wasn't a whole lot underneath it other than we're putting together songs that we're excited about and um, just doing what feels right to us now in our lives. Uh, we're, we're certainly not, um, I, I don't think it's as convoluted as the, the whole idea of reuniting bands sometimes that, that happens. If right. we stay together and make four more records, then those conversations will go by the wayside and mm -hmm. we'll just be making records. Sure. But, so the first record out of the gate, there's always that kind of mm -hmm. conversation, but um, and you wrote more songs. I mean, you wrote lots of songs for this. Yeah. Th does that mean there are more records? Well, yeah, it could, could be. I mean, there were there were a lot of ideas mm -hmm. floating around. I, I I write for my part in the studio, and uh, I, I finished the stuff that we were sounding good on or that we were inspired to do. And then there were there must have been another. I think maybe ten other really reasonable ideas that just 
didn't get finished. Yeah. So yeah, we, we we might well go and do it again. I mean, I think we have we could go in right now instead of touring and probably kick out another album pretty fast. That's yeah. what they used to do back in the 70s. Sure. Now we, we got too much promotion to do. I don't know how they did that. <laughs> I really don't know how they did well, that. As a fan, I hope there is uh, continuously more music one way or the other because Thanks. I do love it. It is great to have you guys back. We're going to gather the sunshine. You're all burning. This Thanks. is this is the hilarity of Binfold's Five on a beach. Yeah. This is we're not where you belong. We're like not beach people. This is not where <laughs> you belong. This is not a beach band. No. <laughs> Sun and fun. Nobody all right. knows how to surf in this band. Yeah. You know we're what? We're all going to learn together. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll put our leather jacket. Happen on Reinhold. Happen, happen on Naked <laughs> Baby Foot. No. We do it every time. Out. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Thanks guys. So much. Appreciate it. Nice to meet you. Binfolds 5 recorded live at the DeLuna Festival, Pensacola, Florida in 2012. Discussing that uh, comeback record, The Sound of the Life of the Mind. Now we'll put the clock back one more year to 2011. It was the first time that I ever got to talk with Ben, and it was just as he released his uh, first uh, career retrospective, The Greatest Hits, which included songs from Ben Folds 5 and his solo career. It also marked 20 years of being an artist. That's all in here as well. Part 4 of Kyle Meredith with Ben Folds. Congratulations on this uh, on this new compilation. You've made it to the point in your career where you get uh, the, the the best of compilation. I've been batting that down for years now, a best of, and uh, it just seemed time to do it because uh, we were discovering a lot of unheard, unreleased material uh, that was really record worthy, um, and in fact was showing uh, to, to be able to kind of hang in there with with the best material I'd done. I think the the, the two extra discs on the set are um, pretty pretty impressive just for having so many unreleased and unheard songs on them. And, and the reason we found those is because we were uh, uh, restoring tapes after a flood. Okay. And they were being transferred, and um, they're just you know, they're just stuff that you forget you did. You know? Does it uh, does it make you feel differently about your career when you look at it? Kind of uh, I don't want to say summed up, but I mean in a sense it is kind of summed up on a three disc package. Yeah, I think it's okay to sum it up because there comes a point where, I mean, even if just a friend, someone, someone I'm just, you know, casual, doesn't know my music that well and will say, uh, you know, could you, do you have a CD of your stuff or what should I buy? I don't know what to tell them to buy yeah. because the records are all kind of different. You know, they all have different personalities. Some people really love one, don't like the other. And uh, this sort of gives me a chance to, to just say, oh, you know, actually you can bypass that stuff and get that if you want to because... You know, I, I mean, what must have Ray Charles thought at some point in his career when he was 75 records or something, and, you know, which one do you tell him to buy? And at some point it becomes a good bet to say, well, you know, I would buy uh, the greatest hits. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, you have to be brutally honest when you're editing the stuff. Why is this song on there, and why is this one deserved to be and the other one not deserved to be? And uh, it's quite a process. Well, uh, and I heard you say uh, in a different interview that... Um that you didn't automatically think this maybe is uh, like these are the greatest hits, but as the title suggests, the best imitation of, of yourself. But uh, as you were looking through them, and, and some songs, uh, you know, are hits, um, were there ones that surprised you over the years that you thought, you know, that song should have been bigger? And on the other side, were there any that surprised you that, um, uh, that, that ended up being big hits that you didn't expect that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there was a while there where... Um we were releasing songs that probably should have been, I think they probably should have been more commercially successful. And um, I don't know what was, what was missing. You know, maybe it was the, uh, you know, that there were suddenly a lot of piano based acts out there um, where when I started there weren't, mm -hmm. you know, and um, you know, that they decided the radio stations maybe decided they, they had room for one or two of those. And, and uh, I don't know what it was, but, uh, I was still fighting it. I felt like, oh, that should that should probably work, and it really didn't. Uh, got really great research or whatever that means. I mean, it was like it was in lots of top requests, but it never, for some reason, uh, wasn't added to playlists. Um, and the same thing happened with Landed. So that was kind of a, a three or four year period um, that, um, that that I think everyone was frustrated. Uh, I, after that, I paid less attention to it because I realized that it, it was it was a game that I didn't need to play. I was still playing for bigger and bigger audiences and doing what I wanted to do. So um, so I let that go. Yeah. And you might have just answered my next question right there, too. Uh, obviously, with the way you talk, you, you know the business. I mean, you've been doing this long enough, the business of, of how a song gets pushed and the campaign and all that. 
um, and especially uh, I, even now, I'm sure you get to use that with the uh, the television turn. Did did that influence your writing uh, through a bit of it? Then, well, I don't know what influences my writing. <laughs> it's hard. It's I, th- I, th- I think I I, I I write from sort of a pl- an impulse that I, I I generally am yet to understand for a few years, mm-hmm. um, and you know it's 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 always a real nebulous thing to discuss what inspires me to write because I don't really know. I just I, I do it, and I think that my writer subconscious brain is smarter than my conscious brain. And, <laughs> and later on, I go, "Wow, that was a really cool thing to have said. How did I know that?" And, mm-hmm. and I didn't. Have you ever dreamed in a fil- in a foreign language that you really don't talk? You ever tried that? No, I've heard of that before. I, I've never done that one. <laughs> um, I, I think the thing is, is that your your brain is working out stuff on all different levels, and and. Uh, Maybe some of it is stuff you don't really want to think about. So if I write in a song, I think, oh, I'm writing about some other dude, or I'm writing something that's fictional. And uh, later on, you know, I, you realize that you're now living what you wrote about five years ago. For this collection, you, uh, I guess, the other big, uh, the other big catch of the whole thing is you put the band back together for a few songs. Yeah. Um, this has kind of been the decade of reunions in a sense. Uh, did you have a feeling on, on reunions and even for yourself, knowing that one day you might, you know, put the five on again? Or or did that come even as a surprise to you that you were going to do it? Yeah, we never planned on doing it or not. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure I thought I would still be in a position to actually do that, you know. Um, we just knew when we broke up that um, we were really tired and that it wasn't inspiring anymore. And uh, we wanted to quit before the effects of that show, mm-hmm. artistically, musically. And uh, then I found myself, you know, with having had a, a flame lit under my ass because I'm like, man, I really need to uh, step up. So um, since then, it's just been a big whirlwind. I've collaborated with all these different people. I've played with symphony orchestras all around the world. I'm doing this television show. It's like I've just been doing so many things. And, and uh, reuniting the, 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 the band for a bit is just a real grounding thing for me now because it's, it's, it's kind of my roots and, and uh, it's, a real comfortable, um, it's a real comfortable outfit. You were mentioning all those collaborations, and I guess I just saw that on your Facebook too, that uh, you had the Tony Bennett duets in your studio. That was all done there? Yeah. Did you have a piece in there? Were well, you not part all of it? of it, but some of it was. Yeah. Were you a part of that in any way? No, I just came in. Uh, I was the studio owner. I shook Tony's hand and welcomed him in the studio, made sure that that, uh, that their catering was working fine and everyone was comfortable, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and took some pictures and uh, got the hell out of the way. That's a heck of a team to have in your, uh, your, your living room. <laughs> oh, it's great. I mean, well, the studio, my studio is is a historic, uh, uh, very, you know, it's, it's a it's a it's a rare. It's, these big studios are dinosaurs. I mean, mm-hmm. people don't need big studios uh, like you know the Abbey Road, um, uh, Oceanway type studios anymore. But we have one of those few spaces. It's the old RCAA room from the fifties, and it's gorgeous. And people like Tony Bennett and and Phil Ramone who produced those tracks. You know, they know uh, what you know. They know the value of it, and um, and, and so they they seek they seek us out. And um, yeah, it's it's just one of the many projects I have is is is, is keeping this historic studio from from being um, you know plowed to the ground in, in lieu of a parking lot. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've obviously got your hand in a lot of things, and it's it, it's kind of fun to hear the business side when you only get to see the the artist side of it. How, how long how long is your career now? Are, are you looking at twenty years? Um, as a recording artist, you know, I think 18, yeah. Yeah, so looking right at it. So uh, a question then, um, what would the Ben Folds of 18 years ago think of you now? I don't know. <laughs> what this, uh, they were kind of making an EPK you know, with Electronics Press Kit, uh, <laughs> a video about the album, which we scrapped. But it started off with someone asking me the question, where will you be in 10 years? And I said, I don't know, it's a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that probably answers that I had no idea. Yeah. I had no idea where I was going. I still don't don't know. I uh, don't know. It's part of the it's part of the fun of it, just to kind of wig out, thinking, "Wow, where could I be?" Well, I don't know. You just don't know. You just keep moving. Yeah. Well, you have made it to TV, and now you've been a few years on that. You are a, you are a TV star at this point. Uh, were, were there ever at, were, were there always aspirations that you'd like to have been on TV? Did you have any uh, t- big heroes that you uh, kind of looked to in the past as as far as television goes? Well, I didn't think of it, but yeah, I mean, I grew up like with TV, like every kid in the seventies, and I suppose I have a uh, sort of preconceived notion of you know how you behave and what it is, and I don't think I ever really thought that I'd be doing it, but 
I mean, I almost look at what we're doing. I, I have this kind of little Hollywood squares or the gong show thing in my head, you know? <laughs> um, and that's just, that's my vintage, yeah. I think I would love to see you take on a new uh, gong show. I think that would be fantastic. Didn't they try to revive that a few years back? Probably. I mean, you know, that's that's that was really ahead of its time, if yeah. you think about it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's a gong show and all kinds of different talent shows and Eurovision and Star Search for a while. There's always been these kind of shows where people come up and present their talent and, and, and then it is judged in some way. Yeah. Well, then, aside from the uh, television show and, of course, the promotion for the uh, the Best of compilation here, anything else we should be looking for? Uh, I'll be producing Sarah Bareilles' EP in November. That, by the way, was planned before she was on the show. Well, that's... Uh, I, if I may brag, I actually recommended her for the show three years ago when it, when it began. Oh. Um, and I'm producing a uh, Amanda Palmer record and then, of course, getting together with uh, uh, Robert Darren for a Ben Foles 5 record. Mm-hmm. I think that's all. I, I'm now on the Nashville Symphony Orchestra Board of Directors, so I'm helping them uh, keep the Symphony Orchestra alive in Nashville and playing with a lot of symphony orchestras on the road. Mm. We know all about that part up here in Louisville, too. The, yeah. the trials of. Yeah, no, that's right. We, 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 we did a show with you guys a few years ago. That's right. And it was great. I was there. Thank you. Well, anyway, sir, uh, it has been a uh, definite pleasure talking to you today. And, Thanks. Uh, you know, we'll look forward to having you back up here in Louisville at some point again, hopefully. Oh, right on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Have yourself a great day, and we'll see you around. Okay. Cheerio. Bye-bye. Bye. Ben Folds, that one's back in 2011, talking about the greatest hits uh, compilation called The Best Imitation of Myself, a retrospective. And that does it for this Ben Folds retrospective of interviews as well. Again, his new biography is called A Dream of Lightning Bugs. And thanks to Mr. Folds for the conversation. Thanks to you for checking us out. Uh, again, if you're already a subscriber to the series, thanks so much. Give us a comment, uh, give a rating, leave a review. Those are always helpful as well. If you're not a subscriber, now's the moment before you get out of here to hit that subscribe button. Whether you found us on YouTube, there's a nice little subscribe and bell over there. You can do it on Spotify and follow along or anywhere you get your favorite podcasts from, including iTunes and Apple Podcasts. And after that, head to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. I premiere brand new songs. We'll do some music news. You'll get anniversary celebrations and clips from these interviews as well. That's WFPK.org. Consequenceofsound.net has your music and film news. You can also find me at Twitter at Kyle Meredith and Facebook slash Kyle Meredith. And that does it for another edition of Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network.